Copyright notice the author hereby grants permission for any and all material within this part one. Tongue talking, rightly divided by Eric Newman. Copyright notice the author hereby grants permission for any and all material within this book to be reproduced free of any fees to the author, provided that said materials are not sold for a profit. Goal the goal of this book is to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, so that members of the body of Christ may come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Contact the author therefore, the author encourages any disagreements be brought to his attention so that future versions of this Bible study can be changed if deemed necessary. You may email the author at bibledivider at gmail.com. Emotionalism has taken over churchianity. I grew up in the Church of God of Prophecy, a Pentecostal holiness church. Holiness meant that they strived to live perfectly according to God's law, as they saw it, along with rules that they had added themselves. Pentecostal meant that they believed that their church should be like the church in Acts 2, which they defined as speaking in tongues and moving in the Holy Ghost. In the 1980s, our thinking was in the minority among churchianity. Most churchgoers would view our services as being crazy and of the devil. Our typical Sunday morning service usually did not have the Holy Ghost moving, but we still only had about 35 people in attendance. Our Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, and revival services are where speaking in tongues and moving in the Holy Ghost flourished. We had only about 10 to 20 people in those meetings. This was in Southern California, where millions of people lived. Typically, the only people who considered our services to be normal were those who grew up in the church. If you were an outsider, it all seemed weird and creepy. To give you an illustration of what I mean, there was a boy about my age who came to Sunday morning services. He lived within a block of the church, and so he walked there by himself each Sunday morning. After he had been attending regularly for about six months, I mentioned to him that we also had services on Sunday night. Therefore, he came back that night. In that service, he saw one man filled with the Holy Ghost, who violently shook his head back and forth uncontrollably. The boy never came back to the church after that. This was the typical reaction of mainstream churchianity to our Pentecostalism because that type of emotionalism was considered not of God and sinful by most of churchianity. They called us holy rollers as a derogatory term. If I went to a Baptist or Nazarene church, for example, not only would there not be speaking in tongues, moving in the Holy Ghost, or the shouting of a praise the Lord, there also probably would not even be a hand raised during the singing of a song. If someone shouted Amen during the preacher's message, most people would turn and wonder, how odd. Who said that? In our services, shouting during the message was common, both by the preacher and by the people in the congregation. That was churchianity in the 1980s. My how things have changed. Today, the trend is toward mega churches, where at least 1,000 people gather together for a service. Most of these churches are called non-denominational, which means they can do whatever they want to do without a mother church poopooing it. While many of them still may not speak in tongues or move in the Holy Ghost, most all of them have accepted some form of the Spirit moving. This even holds true with traditionally non-emotional churches, such as a Methodist church in the country not far from where I live. There, I saw a church worker raise her hands in worship during a song. It is not uncommon today to see all mainstream churches invite the presence of God or the presence of the Spirit to come and fill this place. They put a great emphasis on emotionalism because that is what fills the pews. After all, I now live in Alabama, which is known as part of the Bible Belt, but it is also known as the center of college football mania. Here, Auburn and Alabama fans take their football games very seriously. Case in point, I hung around the Auburn campus one year for the annual game against Alabama. There is a tradition in Auburn that, if they beat Alabama, 
people go to a certain spot on campus and toilet paper a few trees in celebration. In this particular game, Auburn fielded a failed field goal attempt with one second left and ran it all the way back to the end zone for the game-winning score. When this happened, I began walking away from the tree spot to go home. That is when I saw grown men with several rolls of toilet paper in their hands running toward the trees. They had the happiest look on their faces I have ever seen from grown men as they ran in jubilation shouting, War Eagle! War Eagle! Now, I can understand being happy over your team winning, but this kind of excitement was unknown to me. The reason I did not attend the actual game was that it was sold out and that the cheapest seats were going for about $350 each. The stadium holds about 100,000 people, which means that even if all seats were only $350 each, the total revenue from those tickets was $35 million. To that, you can add parking, food, alcohol, souvenirs, hotel stays, and RV space rental. Do not forget the thousands of people who rented space on the college campus just to watch the game on a TV screen that they brought in so that they could hear the cheer of the crowd. The most revenue of all, though, comes from the television rights to broadcast the game. All told that one game easily had hundreds of millions of dollars spent on it. My how things have changed. In the early 1900s, there was a tradition every New Year's Day where a rose parade, consisting of floats and bands, would stroll down the streets of Pasadena, California. This parade was followed by a college football game. At that time, event organizers gave away free tickets to the Rose Bowl game to participants in the Rose Parade, just so they could fill up their stadium with as many people as possible. Today, Tickets go for hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars. Why? Because emotionalism rules in the United States. You may ask, why are we talking about football? I thought this book was about tongue. Talking. My point in bringing up college football is that emotionalism sells. As time has gone on, people have gotten farther away from truth and they spend money in order to feel good, rather than to hear the truth. As Matthew 24 verse 12 says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Therefore, in the Bible Belt, the southeastern United States, which is known for being greater adherence to churchianity than the rest of the United States, hundreds of thousands of people will pay a lot of money to enjoy a college football game for three 12 hours on Saturday night. Then, they will complain about having to sit through an hour-long church service on Sunday morning. Knowing how people will give away their money in order to feel good, there are people that will be rich, who fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows, 1 Timothy 6 verses 9 to 10. In other words, money-minded folks have seen the dichotomy between college football and church and have decided to try to make church like football, in which people will have good emotions, so that they can be rich in money, just like the people who put on college football games are. Knowing this would happen, God said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables, 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 to 4. In other words, when money-minded people develop churches based upon lusts or emotions, those, following their emotions, will leave truth-teaching churches to follow their good emotions, just like they have with college football games. The result is what we see today, a church landscape filled with feel-good services rather than with truth. This is why the mega-church and the non-denominational churches have cropped up. A new church is exciting, just like a new car. Since it is new, you think it is better than the old. This is why traditional names like First Baptist Church are being abandoned for slicker names like The Way, The Rock, Living Water, Celebration, and His Presence. Then, the traditional, denominational churches see their members leave, and they decide to change their churches to be like the new churches. 
Therefore, even the First Methodist Church ends up abandoning tradition in favor of hand-raising worship music. Therefore, new churches tend to add emotionalism to their doctrinal statements in order to get people to attend. For example, Church of the Highlands, the second largest church in the United States, has a statement of faith with the typical statements about the Bible, the Trinity, Jesus Christ, salvation, and water baptism that you would find in denominational churches. However, they also say that the Holy Spirit is manifested through a variety of spiritual gifts to build and sanctify the church. All believers are commanded to earnestly desire the manifestation of the gifts in their lives. Their statement of faith goes on to say that healing of the sick is included in the commission of Jesus to his disciples. It is given as a gift, which is to follow believers. It is one of the gifts of the Spirit. Moreover, they say, it is the Father's will for believers to become whole, healthy, and successful in all areas of life. From https colon slash slash www.churchofthehighlands.com slash about slash faith accessed March 24th. 2020, if you went to a service at Church of the Highlands or asked people who go there, you would probably be told that the church is like a regular Baptist church, except that it is much bigger. Yet, their aforementioned doctrine is emotionalism that would not have been found in any Baptist church in the 1980s. However, emotionalism is seen in most every Baptist church in 2020. This demonstrates how Pentecostalism or Charismatics have infiltrated mainstream churchianity to the point that even conservative churches have accepted praying for the presence of the Spirit to fill their church services, closing their eyes and raising their hands in worship services, and believing that speaking in tongues and divine healings are accepted things that God does today, even if they are not present in a conservative church. At the same time, attendance at Pentecostal churches has skyrocketed. A conservative estimate is that at least 500 million people worldwide are charismatic churchgoers. Why? Because people have heaped to themselves teachers that will scratch the itch of the lusts of their flesh, 2 Timothy 4 verse 3. Contrast this with what God says about wisdom. God says that wise men have good lifestyles that show their works with meekness of wisdom, James 3 verse 13, while the devil's wisdom is earthy, sensual, James 3 verse 15. In other words, those who allow Christ to live in them have sound doctrine built up in their inner man so that they live based upon the wisdom of God found in the Bible. Those who do not have Christ living in them are earthy, sensual. They live based upon their senses or emotions. God's will is for all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. In this way, Christ lives in them because Christ is the word of God, John 1 verse 1. If you do not know the truth, the truth cannot make you free, John 8 verse 32. Therefore, you will live by the devil's wisdom of sensualism and emotionalism resulting in giving yourself over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, Ephesians 4 verse 19. We will now show how speaking in tongues is part of the devil's wisdom of sensualism. History of speaking in tongues Most people's knowledge about speaking in tongues is based solely upon what they have seen in their church or heard from family and friends who are Pentecostal. They may know a few scriptures, but the meaning of those scriptures has been changed to fit the philosophy of their church, rather than the actual meaning of the scriptures. With this being the case, we will start with the history of speaking in tongues in America to show that speaking in tongues is based on emotionalism, rather than on following God's word. Around 170 AD, a man named Montanus said that he was the personal spokesman for the Holy Ghost. He taught typical Christian doctrine, except that he taught the spontaneity of the Holy Ghost, Pentecostal, and a more conservative personal ethic, holiness. This shows that my childhood church's label of Pentecostal holiness goes back over 1,800 years. When Montanus spoke for the Holy Ghost, he became beside himself, and being suddenly in a sort of frenzy and ecstasy, he raved, and began to babble and utter strange things. He said he was possessed by God and unable to resist. From Montanism on Wikipedia, 
https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash montanism accessed may 14th 2020 speaking in tongues is also not limited to the christian religion Felicitas Goodman studied a number of Pentecostal communities, including English-Spanish-and Mayan-speaking Spanish -dash, and Mayan -speaking groups. She compared what she found with recordings of non-Christian rituals from Africa, Borneo, Indonesia, and Japan. She took into account both the segmental structure, such as sounds, syllables, phrases, and the supersegmental elements, rhythm, accent, intonation, and concluded that there was no distinction between what was practiced by the Pentecostal Protestants and the followers of other religions. From Glossolalia on Wikipedia, https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash glossolalia, accessed May 12th, 2020, L. Carlisle May says that speaking in tongues occurs frequently among the Eskimos of the Hudson Bay area. The priestesses of North Borneo speak incantations in a language known only to the spirits and themselves. The tribal doctors of the modern Quilinsinga and Pasta groups of the Andes recite unintelligible prayers as they heal their patients. Speaking in tongues also occurs during seances on the Japanese islands of Hokkaido and Honshu. Even Herodotus and Virgil wrote of priests speaking strange languages while possessed. From http colon slash slash www.sermonindex.net slash module slash newbie slash viewtopic.php question mark topic underscore id equals sign 6290 ampersand form equals sign 35 ampersand start equals sign 20 accessed May 12th, 2020. If you ask Pentecostals when speaking in tongues began in America, they will probably point to the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles in 1906 as the start of the movement. However, speaking in tongues in America actually began around 1830, and most tongue talkers until 1900 were Mormons. To understand how tongue talking started in America, let us look at a little history regarding religions. For the most part, sovereign nations fix religions for their constituents. If you grow up in Saudi Arabia, you are Muslim, whether you like it or not. Several hundred years ago in England, the national religion was Christian, which would be called Catholic today. Then, in the early 1500s, the Protestant Reformation swept through England. After that, being a Christian meant that you were either Catholic or Protestant. The king slash queen fixed which one it was. So, if you were Protestant and the new queen was Catholic, you either converted to Catholicism or risked being killed for not conforming to the nation's religion. Religious Freedom in Protestantism Perhaps the greatest accomplishment of Protestantism was to create and distribute the Bible in the common language of the people. This resulted in people coming to their own conclusions about what the Bible says, instead of believing what their nation told them to believe. Over the years, many denominations developed within Protestantism. So, now being Christian was not just Catholic or Protestant, but it was Catholic, Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, Quaker, etc. America was largely founded by people who fled their home country in search of religious freedom. The New England colonists were largely Puritans who led very strict lives. The Middle colonists were a mixture of religions, including Quakers, led by William Penn, Catholics, Lutherans, Jews, and others. The Southern colonists had a mixture of religions as well, including Baptists and Anglicans. HTTP colon slash slash www.socialstudies4kids.com slash articles slash US history slash one three colonies church htm access June 27th, 2018. With the exception of Jews, all of these religions fell under the Christian umbrella, even though beliefs within the Christian denominations varied greatly. Since all of these denominations wanted religious freedom, America, while attaching itself to no specific variant of Christianity, operated on an understanding that the nation would adopt an unofficial, generic Christianity that fit hand in glove with republicanism. Certain fundamentals seemed unanimously agreed upon, posting of the Ten Commandments in public places was appropriate, 
prayers and virtually all official and public functions were expected, America was particularly blessed because of her trust in God, and even when individuals in civic life did not ascribe to a specific faith, they were expected to act like good Christians and conduct themselves as would a believer. A Patriot's History of the United States by Larry Schwakert and Michael Allen Page 95 In the 1790s through the 1840s, America went through a second great awakening in which many turned to God. As a result, toleration was more than ever demanded. Schools certainly had to avoid specific denominational positions, so they emphasized elements of Christianity that almost all believers could agree upon, such as the resurrection, love, faith, and hope. That in turn led to a revitalization of the Ten Commandments as easily agreed upon spiritual principles. A Patriot's History of the United States by Larry Schwakert and Michael Allen Page 208 It was during the Second Great Awakening that speaking in tongues became part of a Christian denomination, a new one called Mormonism. How Mormons started speaking in tongues Although Pentecostals looked to people like Charles Parham and William Seymour as starting modern tongue talking in the 1900s, Sidney Rigdon appears to be the one who should receive the credit for starting the speaking in tongues movement in America. Sidney moved to the Kirtland, Ohio area in 1826 as a Campbellite preacher. Alexander Campbell taught a restoration of the ancient order of things. Rigdon went a step farther than Campbell did by saying that supernatural gifts and miracles should be restored. Campbell disagreed. In June 1830, Rigdon's thoughts were rejected by the Campbellites, and he left the movement. In 1829, Parley P. Pratt accepted Rigdon's gospel and sold his farm one year later to become a preacher. Pratt then was introduced to the Book of Mormon and joined the Mormons. Pratt then converted Rigdon to Mormonism on November 14, 1830. About 130 people in Rigdon's flock then converted to Mormonism. Rigdon went to New York and spent six weeks with Joseph Smith. It appears that Rigdon taught speaking in tongues to Smith during those six weeks. In February 1831, Smith moved. The New York Mormon Church to Kirtland, Ohio. Smith taught that Adam was the God of the earth. Therefore, Adam's language should be the language of the earth. He taught that this pure language was corrupted at Babel. A restoration of the Adamic language is what he saw as part of the modern-day restoration of the church. Certain aspects of the Mormon church is tied to the Adamic tongue. From speaking in tongues LDS church history, lds-church-history.blogspot.com slash 2012 slash 10 slash speaking dash in tongues.html accessed May 14th, 2020. Joseph Smith taught that speaking in tongues was the restoration of this original Adamic language. From 1833 to 1836, speaking in tongues was a church-wide phenomenon. Since Joseph Smith saw speaking in tongues as the restoration of the language of Adam, tongues became a sign to early Mormons that the restored gospel and the Book of Mormon were truly from God. Mormon leader Orson Pratt wrote in 1884, they would have had reason to doubt whether they were true believers, but when they received tongues, together with all other promised blessings, they were no longer in doubt, but were assured, not only of the truth of the doctrine, but that they themselves were accepted of God. Meanwhile, outsiders guessed that speaking in tongues was used churchwide as a cover for the church's failed prophecies. Outsiders began to object to the church when they saw that Mormon kids also spoke in tongues. Remember, America was still a Christian nation at the time. Thus, in September 1834, Smith redefined the use of tongues to be only for preaching the gospel in other languages rather than speaking within the church itself. During the mid-1800s, speaking in tongues was so commonplace in the LDS and RLDS churches that a person who had not spoken in tongues, or who had not heard others do so, was a rarity. Journals and life histories of that period are filled with instances of the exercise of this gift of the Spirit. Between 1837 and 1899, though the saints continued to speak in the Adamic language, church leaders emphasized the utility of speaking in foreign languages. 
In addition to speaking in tongues, the phenomenon of singing in tongues became quite common in England and the United States. By 1900, speaking in tongues did not fit into the corporate worship experience they were trying to establish because an established church emphasizes order, authority, permission, and control. Thus, in the April 1900 General Conference, President Joseph F. Smith warned, There is perhaps no gift of the Spirit of God more easily imitated by the devil than the gift of tongues. When two men or women exercise the gift of tongues by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, there are a dozen perhaps that do it by the inspiration of the devil. So far as I am concerned, if the Lord will give me the ability to teach the people in my native tongue or in their own language to the understanding of those who hear me, that will be sufficient gift of tongues to me. In so speaking, Smith said that tongues were only legitimate for missionary work. Thus, speaking in tongues quickly disappeared from the Mormon church. By the mid-1900s, the gift of tongues had been redefined by the church as the ability to quickly learn a foreign language. From https colon slash slash www.dialoguejournal.com slash wp content slash upload slash sbi slash articles slash dialogue underscore v24n01 underscore 15.pdf accessed May 14, 2020, this redefinition was necessary because, in 1842, Joseph Smith wrote the Mormon Church's 13 Articles of Faith, mimicking the 13 Articles of America's Bill of Rights. These Articles of Faith are still contained today in the Pearl of Great Price, which is one of Mormon's three holy books. The Book of Mormon and Doctrines and Covenants are their other holy books. The seventh article states, We believe in the gift of tongues, prophecy, revelation, visions, healing, interpretation of tongues, and so forth. From Articles of Faith, Latter-day Saints, https forward slash forward slash n dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash articles underscore of underscore faith underscore latter underscore day underscore saints, accessed May 14th, 2020. Therefore, the gift of tongues could not be removed from Mormonism, explaining the redefinition of the gift that occurred in Mormonism in the mid-1900s. Did Mormons become Pentecostals? I believe it is no coincidence that the official removal of speaking in tongues in 1900 in Mormonism coincides almost perfectly with the starting of speaking in tongues in the modern-day Pentecostal movement. Mormons in the 1800s were taught that speaking in tongues was the evidence that God was with them. When the president of Mormonism tells you that speaking in tongues is of the devil, there will be some who will abandon Mormonism and start speaking in tongues elsewhere. I do not know how many did this, but I would think most of the tongue talkers left the church for Pentecostalism. This conclusion is based upon what I saw take place in the church of my childhood, the Church of God of Prophecy. When I first started going to the Church of God of Prophecy, the church forbade its members from wearing jewelry of any kind. The church taught that they were the exclusive bride of Christ, and the evidence of speaking in tongues was a big part of that claim. In the early 1990s, the general overseer slash president of the church began allowing married people to wear wedding rings. To some in the church, this showed that the church was no longer the true church. My grandmother said that speaking in tongues was reduced substantially in the church after this because the church went against God's command not to wear jewelry. Therefore, they were no longer the exclusive bride of Christ. A group of devout believers left the church and started their own church, called the Concerned Group and called themselves the Exclusive Bride of Christ. All of this happened over wedding bands. Therefore, it is not far-fetched to believe that Mormons left Mormonism when they were told that the very practice that was evidence that God was with the church, i.e., speaking in tongues, was now of the devil. Why not leave for a group of people who speak in tongues? We already know that some Mormons left when the Mormons abandoned polygamy. They formed the fundamental Latter-day Saints Church and migrated from Salt Lake City, Utah to Southern Utah slash Northern Arizona, where they continued their polygamous lifestyle. Why wouldn't Mormons do the same when their president told them to stop speaking in tongues? History tells us that it was around 1900 that some Mormons had begun migrating to Los Angeles from Utah. 
The Azusa Street Revival began in Los Angeles in 1906. Did ex-Mormons spur this revival along? It is possible. While Pentecostalism holds more so to fundamental churchianity doctrine than Mormonism does, both movements believe that God is speaking to them in the latter days. The Mormons still call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Pentecostals are also part of the Latter-day movement, as they cite speaking in tongues in Acts 2 verse 4 as what they are trying to get back to. In explaining speaking in tongues, Peter said, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, Acts 2 verses 16 to 17. A good Mormon in the 1800s believed that speaking in tongues was the evidence that Mormons were the church of the latter days, but then the Mormons stopped teaching that. Then, a Pentecostal came along and taught that God was restoring his latter-day church in Pentecostalism, and the Pentecostals taught speaking in tongues. Wouldn't a good Mormon who believed in speaking in tongues believe that Pentecostalism was now God's true church instead of Mormonism? In my opinion, then, the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles in 1906 that started modern-day Pentecostalism probably would not have happened if the Mormon Church did not officially state in 1900 that speaking in tongues is of the devil. Please note that I am not saying that ex-Mormons started the Pentecostal movement. I am merely saying that I believe that Mormons leaving their church for the speaking in tongues and Pentecostalism is what made the Pentecostal movement grow. Granted, Pentecostalism has a different story as to how speaking in tongues started, and I do not doubt their story is true. However, I do not think that the movement of Pentecostalism would have gotten off the ground if not for tongue talkers coming to it from the Mormon church. I do not have evidence for this assertion. It is just my educated guess. How tongue talking started in Pentecostalism Note, I have attempted to give an objective view of the history of tongue talking in Pentecostalism. However, authors tend to give a biased view as they record history. When it comes to a history of tongue, talking among Pentecostals, most of that information comes from Pentecostals. This means they will give a positive view of their movement. For this reason, I have tried to find objective sources so that the following history is accurate, but keep in mind that I may not have been entirely successful in this endeavor. Pentecostalism is the ancient heresy of Montanism revived. Some say that Pentecostalism began with Edward Irving, a Presbyterian minister in Scotland in the early 1800s. After studying the Book of Acts, he began to teach that what the early church experienced was to be normative for the church in his day. On March 28, 1830, a Miss Mary Campbell began to speak in other tongues and claimed she was divinely healed. The following year, on October 30, 1831, her sister, Mrs. Cardell, also began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. Neomontanism, https colon slash slash www.bible.ca slash tongues dash neomontanism.htm accessed May 14th, 2020. John Alexander Dowie. However, in my view, Pentecostalism's history begins with John Alexander Dowie. Granted, there were a few preachers, like Edward Irving, who taught tongue talking before him. However, I think the real Pentecostal movement began with Dowie. The reason I say this is that Dowie staged elaborate divine healings at the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. He arranged for carefully screened individuals to be brought on stage to be healed. John Alexander Dowie in Wikipedia, https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash john underscore alexander underscore Dowie accessed May 16th. 2020. This brought a lot of attention to his teachings. In 1893, there were no cars, airplanes, radio, television, or internet. People relied about word of mouth and newspapers for their news. This meant that news was very much localized. Since Dowie staged faked healings at the Chicago's World's Fair, many people all over the United States heard about it, which is why I credit Dowie with starting the spread of Pentecostalism. John Alexander Dowie taught Restorationism that all the extraordinary powers which Christ gave to his 
apostles would be restored to the church immediately preceding his second coming. This included speaking in tongues. Dowie stated in 1897, I think some of you are getting a new tongue. You are getting a tongue that gives praise to the Lord for a new blessing that has come into your homes, and he is giving us new tongues. We have not everything yet, that is true, but he gives the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge and faith and gifts of healing and workings of miracles and prophecy and discernings of spirits, and he will give us in due time tongues and interpretation of tongues. He will. That is coming in its right time. Leaves of Healing, April 10th, 1897. Life and Ministry of John Alexander Dowie, compiled by Charles A. Jennings, accessed August 6th, 2020, at http colon slash slash tiruthanhistory.org slash life dash ministry dash of dash john dash alexander dash dowie dot html. Dowie had a faith healing center known as the City of Zion near Chicago and prohibited the ill from seeking medical assistance under his charge. This led to his downfall. He was soon charged with manslaughter by the state of Illinois. Many declared him to be Elijah, and he himself made this claim in 1901, adorning the robes of the Jewish high priest, which led to many followers leaving him. Early Faith Healers, http colon slash slash www.unitypublishing.com slash neoreligious movement slash erlyfaithhalers dot html accessed May 16th, 2020. Still, Dowie's following was large. Dowie forced his followers to deposit their funds in Zion Bank and sold worthless stock in an array of Zion's businesses. He lived in lavish personal luxury. His wife and children even left him because of his questionable practices. Back then, most people had morals. His chief lieutenant said that 2.5 to 3.4 million in funds were unaccounted for, which is probably close to 100 million in today's dollars. John Alexander Dowie in Wikipedia, https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash john underscore alexander underscore dowie accessed may 16th 2020 it is probably due to his money pilfering scheme that pentecostals like to start the pentecostal movement with the azusa street revival in 1906 however dowie had a tremendous influence in the beginning of the movement the Dictionary of Pentecostal and Charismatic Movements notes that many of the most famous Pentecostal evangelists went out from Zion, page 368, and dozens of Parm's followers at Zion joined the Assemblies of God at its formation in 1914. In fact, three of the original eight members of the AOG General Council were from Dowie's Zion City, page 370. Pentecostal Movement in the U.S. HTTP colon slash slash www.roberry.org slash frickage site slash pen.htm accessed August 6, 2020. Frank Sandford Frank Sandford was the pastor of a church in Maine. In August 1891, after performing an exorcism and claiming to hear the voice of God in a forest warn him of Armageddon, he established a commune called the Shiloh in Durham, Maine. At its height, the Shiloh had more than 600 residents who attempted to live in the supernatural. None worked for pay, and all depended on God to supply their material needs. To live at Shiloh meant to be in a constant state of readiness for the Holy Spirit's latest, as Sanford put it. From Frank Sanford on Wikipedia, https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash frank underscore Sanford, accessed August 6th, 2020, the Lewiston Evening Journal of January 6, 1900, reported that during Shiloh's New Year's Eve prayer and praise service, the gifts of tongues descended. Sanford said that there were 120 people present, the same number gathered at the first Pentecost in the Book of Acts, but he insisted to the newspaper that the speaking in tongues was of foreign languages, not a special language given by the Holy Ghost. From Frank Sanford on Wikipedia, https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash frank underscore sanford accessed may 14th 2020 charles parham charles parham was a supply pastor in a methodist church in 1895 he left the church complaining that methodist preachers were not left to preach by direct inspiration 
Sometime after the birth of his son, Claude, in September 1897, both Parham and Claude fell ill. Attributing their subsequent recovery to divine intervention, Parham renounced all medical help and committed to preach divine healing and prayer for the sick. In 1898, Parham moved his headquarters to Topeka, Kansas, where he operated a mission and an office. From Charles Fox Parham on Wikipedia, https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash charles underscore fox underscore parm accessed august 6 2020 parm took a sabbatical from topeka in 1900 in order to know more fully the latest truths restored by the latter-day movements from charles fox parm on wikipedia https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash charles underscore fox underscore parm accessed may 14th 2020 he visited several movements including frank sanford's school at shiloh parm stayed at shiloh for a month held meetings with sanford in winnipeg for another and then returned to topeka kansas to found bethel bible college patterned after shiloh from frank sanford on wikipedia https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash frank underscore sanford accessed may 14th 2020 from parm's later writings it appears he incorporated some but not all of the ideas he observed at shiloh into his view of bible truths which he later taught at his bible schools in addition to having an impact on what he taught, it appears he picked up his Bible school model and other approaches from Sanford's work. Parham is credited with originating the doctrine of initial evidence that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is evidenced by speaking in tongues. It was this doctrine that made Pentecostalism distinct from other holiness Christian groups that spoke in tongues or believed in an experience subsequent to salvation and sanctification. From Charles Fox Parm on Wikipedia, https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash charles underscore fox underscore parm accessed May 14th, 2020. Lucy Farrow and William Seymour. In 1895, William Seymour, a black man, moved to Indianapolis and became a Christian. Shortly afterward, he was introduced to the holiness movement through Daniel S. Warner's Evening Light. Saints. In 1901, Seymour moved to Cincinnati and attended God's Bible School and Training Home, a school founded by holiness preacher Martin Wells Knapp. In 1903, Seymour moved to Houston. In 1905, Charles Parham founded a Bible school in Houston. At that time, a black holiness leader by the name of Lucy F. Farrow took a position with Charles Parham's evangelistic team as his children's nanny. Pharaoh, then, asked Seymour to pastor her church. In 1906, with Pharaoh's encouragement, Seymour joined Parham's newly founded Bible school. Seymour began preaching with Parham. During this time, Seymour continued praying that he would receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit, which he did not receive at that time. Within one month of studying under Parham, Seymour received an invitation to pastor a holiness mission in Los Angeles founded by Julia Hutchins, who intended to become a missionary to Liberia. Parham thought Seymour was unqualified, but Seymour went to Los Angeles anyway. He arrived on February 22, 1906. Seymour preached that speaking in tongues was the evidence of having received the Holy Ghost, which was against the mission's teachings, resulting in him being kicked out. He then stayed with a friend, Edward Lee, and started a Bible study there. It grew too large for the house, and it moved to Richard Asbury's house. Seymour continued preaching the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, and the group continued to pray. However, no one was speaking in tongues. He invited two friends from Houston to come to Los Angeles, Lucy Farrow and Joseph Warren. On April 9th, Edward Lee spoke in tongues after Seymour and Lucy Farrow laid hands on him. Once Seymour told the whole group what happened, someone else started speaking in tongues. Three days later, Seymour spoke in tongues after a long evening spent in prayer. From William J. Seymour on Wikipedia, 
https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash william underscore j dot underscore seymour accessed may 16th 2020 seymour's experience tells us that speaking in tongues is not the modern day evidence of having the holy ghost faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god romans 10 verse 17 William Seymour preached the same message of speaking in tongues in order to receive the Holy Ghost every day from February 22nd to April. 8. A period of 45 days, and then no one spoke in tongues. Then, on April 9th, Seymour preached the exact same message as before. This time, Edward Lee started speaking in tongues. Seymour then started speaking in tongues just three days later. We must conclude, then, that speaking in tongues is not related to having eternal life or the Holy Ghost. Rather, it is tied to someone with authority laying hands on a person. Lucy Farrow was this authority because she had already spoken in tongues through her interactions with Parham in Houston. In fact, Lucy Farrow is known by Pentecostals as the anointed handmaiden who laid her hands on many who received the gift of tongues. From Lucy F. Farrow on Wikipedia, https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash lucy underscore f dot underscore pharaoh accessed may 16th 2020 this began the azusa street revival which lasted until 1915 hundreds of thousands of people attended the revival over the years we should also note that edward lee speaking in tongues on april 9th 1906 was three days into an intended 10-day fast from Azusa Street Revival on Wikipedia, https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash Azusa underscore street underscore revival accessed August 6, 2020. The 10th day would have been April 16th, which was one day after Easter that year. Easter is the celebration of the Queen of Heaven Easter, which is the religious system of Satan. I do not think it was a coincidence that the revival of speaking in tongues started so close to a high satanic day. A.J. Tomlinson Lest you doubt that the Azusa Street Revival's tongue talking came from the laying on of hands by an anointed person, we will now look at A.J. Tomlinson. Tomlinson was also a student of Frank Sanford at Shiloh. He was baptized there three times, including by Sanford himself in October 1901 http colon slash slash www.unitypublishing.com slash new religious movement slash watspirit part 6 html accessed may 16th 2020 in 1902 richard sperling became pastor of a holiness group in 1903 aj tomlinson came into this church and became its leader the name church of god was officially adopted in 1907 from Church of God of Prophecy on Wikipedia, https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash church underscore of underscore god underscore of underscore prophecy accessed May 12th, 2020. Tomlinson heard what was going on with William Seymour and the Azusa Street Revival. In his 1913 book The Last Great Conflict, Tomlinson wrote, in January 1907, I became more fully awakened on the subject of receiving the Holy Ghost as he was poured out on the day of Pentecost. That whole year I ceased not to preach that it was our privilege to receive the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues as they did on the day of Pentecost. I did not have the experience, so I was almost always among the seekers at the altar. By the close of the year I was so hungry for the Holy Ghost that I scarcely cared for food, friendship, or anything else. I wanted the one thing the baptism with the Holy Ghost. I wrote to G.B. Cashwell and asked him to come to our place for a few days. Cashwell had attended the Azusa Street Revival and was sharing his experience throughout the Southeastern United States. He agreed to preach at the Church of God's General Assembly in January 1908. Cashwell arrived in Cleveland on Friday and preached at least the Saturday evening and Sunday morning services. Regarding Sunday morning, Cashwell says that he gave only a few minutes talk and asked all those who wanted the baptism of the Holy Ghost to come to the altar. The altar was full in a minute and many knelt in the aisle. He then stated, 
We are expecting great things here if everybody will stay out of the way of the Holy Ghost. For received the baptism of the Holy Ghost that morning including Tomlinson. According to Tomlinson, while Cashwell was concluding his message, the spirit came on me and down I went on the floor, right by the side of the stand on the rostrum. Tomlinson continued, My mind was clear, but a peculiar power so enveloped and thrilled my whole being that I concluded to yield myself up to God and await results. Those results for Tomlinson were dramatic. They included shaking, rolling, tossing, and a sense of levitation. He recorded, as I lay there great joy flooded my soul. The happiest moments I had ever known up to that time. Oh, such floods and billows of glory ran through my whole being. These waves of joy were then followed by a vision in which Tomlinson traveled to many areas of the world including all the inhabited continents. In his vision, Tomlinson believed that his tongue's speech was in fact the languages of the native peoples of the countries he was visiting. This was a common belief among many early Pentecostals who were convinced that the purpose of the latter-day reign was to provide the church with supernatural tools to win the lost in the last days. Also in Tomlinson's vision, devils were cast out, people were saved, and he was reminded of Mark 16 and signs following believers. In his journal Tomlinson concluded, this was really the baptism of the Holy Ghost as they received him on the day of Pentecost, for they all spake with tongues. With all I have written it is not yet told, but judging from the countries I visited I spoke in ten different languages. From really the baptism of the Holy Spirit by David G. Roebuck, January 14th, 08 http colon slash slash cogheritage.org slash index.php slash article slash view slash really underscore the underscore baptism underscore of underscore the underscore holy underscore spirit accessed May 12th, 2020. The Church of God is now the Church of God of Prophecy. My Childhood Church. The church still speaks in tongues and boasts over 1.5 million members worldwide from Church of God of Prophecy on Wikipedia https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash church underscore of underscore god underscore of underscore prophecy accessed august 6th 2020 as with william seymour aj tomlinson preached speaking in tongues without ever having received it as with seymour tomlinson prayed many times to receive the gift of speaking in tongues but did not receive it until someone came who already spoke in tongues Based upon these experiences, the speaking in tongues experienced at Azusa Street Revival, the Church of God, and many other places is none other than the manifestation of a Kundalini Yoga spirit. Kundalini Yoga Kundalini Yoga is part of the Hindu religion. The name means coiled serpent. Kundalini practitioners say that there is a concentrated field of intelligent, cosmic invisible energy absolutely vital to life resident in every human. This energy begins in the base of the spine, fed by the chakras along the spine. There are seven chakras from the base of the spine to the head. The sixth chakra is the third eye, located in the forehead between your two eyes. Through practicing kundalini yoga, along with chanting, meditation, and an impartation from the guru one can have their kundalini awakened, which means that the energy is released through the third eye. Physical manifestations of the awakened kundalini include being slain in the spirit, uncontrollable laughter, physical jerks, new spiritual insights and revelations, spontaneous movements, revival-like meetings, feeling energy, repetitive singing slash chanting, clearing the mind slash emotionalism, speaking in tongues, awakened by laying on of hands, miracles, healings, prophecy, trances, seeing visions, and reading minds. From https colon slash slash www.bible.ca slash tongues dash kundalini dash shakers dash charisma sticks dot htm accessed May 16, 2020. Note from the description that these physical manifestations take place via an impartation from the guru. At the Azusa Street Revival, no one spoke in tongues until Lucy Pharaoh laid her hands on them. At the Church of God, no one spoke in tongues until GB. Cashwell preached at their general assembly. I believe this demonstrates that Pharaoh and Cashwell were really kundalini yoga gurus, although they may not have known it. 
Therefore, this so-called latter-day moving of the Holy Ghost via speaking in tongues is really nothing more than an ancient Hindu practice with a form of godliness, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, attached to it by putting it in a Christian context.